David Lyas. This is RSL Today, this evening, and I'm here with my co-host, Keith Harrison. And I, you're looking well, David. And I, did, I didn't mess it up. <laughs> no, no, no. I nearly did. <laughs> How are you going, mate? Yeah, don't go off the script, whatever you're doing. No, what script? What script? <laughs> mate, I, I spent a lot of time getting this program organised. Yeah, thank you very much no, for putting you know that. programming t- together. And uh, here's, here's proof, he says, showing the microphone, yeah. our schedule for the year. Mate, um, good week that was? Yeah, it was, yeah. Excellent. Yep. yep. So we're getting more and more hits on our social media. So this is always that, a good that, sign. That'll, that'll lead me into the uh, our details. The phone number RSL South Australia is eight one zero zero seven three zero zero. Twitter. Uh, yes. Facebook. Facebook. Instagram. Yes. Instagram. Email. All, all, all e- the above. Email is admin at rslsa.org.au and our website is rslsa.org.au. And uh, look, that social media is uh, just so valuable to us. Uh, yeah, it, it's, we're up into the thousands and thousands of people who uh, check in regularly. And speaking of checking in, I've pretty well got all the ANZAC details that people need to know, especially about the uh, the Adelaide events, and that's on rslsa.org.au. You, you'll find the events calendar, and then within that, a dedicated page to ANZAC Day, which has the uh, the ANZAC March Guide, uh, the bulletins that we've sent out to the sub-branches uh, recently, a, a template for conducting your own service because a lot of people will have to do probably do light up the dawn again. They won't mm. be able to get along uh, to a dawn service. So there's more and more on light up the dawn, which is where you commemorate from home, from your driveway, balcony, lounge room. Uh, there'll also be some merchandise uh, that I'll learn of soon, such as uh, candles, uh, stickers for the front of the house for the for your bin uh, things like that pa- and they'll come in packs there's going to be what they call an ambassador's pack where where you'll get that and then invite people in your neighborhood to take part in a commemoration or it sounds like a good idea or, or you yeah. do it on your own as a supporters pack yeah. so yeah. Um, th- that'll all be handled from a uh, an interstate uh, promotional company and uh, uh, encourage people to uh, light up the dawn it sounds good mate yeah yeah now, before we go to our guest, who's graciously come back in this week, Peter, thank you. Uh, I forgot to mention last week um, the part, the uh, passing of the former Naval Association of South Australian branch, Jean Hudson, also uh, president of the Rands <coughs> Association. Um, Jean passed away about two weeks ago. Now, a very very sad. Yeah, Jean, lovely lady. Jean used to get along to lots of meetings and w- yes. was the representative, not in the best of health. But no, uh, hasn't been for quite some time. Yeah. But yeah, she passed away peacefully and uh, very, very sad. Yeah. So, Lest Vale, we forget. vale Jean, one yeah. of the early Rands. Yeah. yeah, David, before we go to our guest, I forgot to mention that uh, our case navigator for the RSL Employment Program, Lauren, moved yes. on several weeks ago yes. and she's been replaced uh, with Hayley Kovacic. And uh, Hayley's very capable, comes from an employment background, uh, very impressive, and, and will take on that. To the, well, the, we'll get her in. Exactly. Yeah, we'll get her in to talk. Yeah, so um, she will then become the case navigator for South Australian um, Defence and partner, uh, de- ex-Defence uh, partners and people who are transitioning out and have got a definite leave-by date uh, yep. can, can qualify for the uh, uh, employment program so they can... Uh, uh, register online, get into the system, and then uh, and then come to to Haley to be handled from there. So, that's good, doesn't it? Yeah, I reckon. Like you said, we'll uh, we'll get her in for an interview. Yeah. So um, that's pretty well it. But all right, mate. Well, Peter, first of all, thank you for coming back this evening. Have you had a good week? <laughs> yep, very good indeed. <laughs> Excellent. That's the way. Um, now we were we had to cut you off last week because. As usual, this show just flies. It just flies through the ethernet. Um, we were talking about a young lady fr- who went to Unley High. I know, Mitchum. Mitchum. No, she went to Unley High. Oh, did she? She went to Mitchum oh, Primary. Okay. Right. I'm uh, and, and she went to Gallipoli as a result of uh, some stuff that she did. Um, but you you started writing books. Obviously, you're a historian. You enjoy it, obviously. So what about the books? Did you enjoy writing them? Um, it becomes a disease. <laughs> Luckily for me, the first one um, 
sold very, very well. It's still on the market after being released in 1991. And then, of course, if you sell, publishers actually keep talking to you. <laughs> and uh, I, But the, I think the interesting thing about the eight books is that I didn't necessarily plan, plan them. Mm. Um, I was contacted to write Gone Has Gone, the second one, and that was for Headquarters Training Command in Sydney. It was the fourth in the series, but they'd all been published within the Army. And so my publisher got wind of it and did a deal with the Army, and so Gone Has Gone was published in the marketplace and did well. The third one, uh, which was really the sequel to those Ragged Bloody Heroes, I didn't plan. I made a speech at the USI at uh, Keswick and three second tenth blokes came up to me and said, oh, well done on the uh, speech, but you haven't told all of the story. You haven't done uh, Milne Bay and Buna and San Ananda. And so that led to three or four more years and the spell broken. Mm. So that sort of completed the Papuan campaign. Um, we Band of Brothers, um, that book means a lot to me in the sentimental sense that I had a guy kept called or a gentleman called Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Honor who was the commanding officer of the 39th Battalion. Mm. He had edited and took great interest in heroes and Gone Has Gone and when he passed on, uh, the Army decided they put David Horner in charge of a project of doing a series of biographies on Australian commanders and they didn't have a battalion commander. And so they thought, ah, Ralph Honor, Bruin's worked with him. We'll get Bruin to do it. <laughs> and so that that was really my way of thanking Ralph, even yeah. though he wasn't here to be thanked. Oh. Um, and then you get to books like um, uh, Descent into Hell. That just became a monster that I didn't plan. Um, it started off being me interested in the fall of Singapore and then I could see a relationship between the campaign and what went on in Changi. And then, unfortunately for me, I could see a, <laughs> a relationship between Changi and the Thai Burma Railway. Yeah. So one book became 750, 800-page book. It's a huge book. It's a big one. It's a big book. Um, now, you and I have had numerous conversations, um, and you, you said to me um, not that long ago that you would never write... <laughs> a book on World War One, and yet here I've, I've just finished reading only a few weeks ago, Our Great Hearted Men, which I think was very very good, but it's a World War One book, and I, it's a, it's well written, it's it covers a, what the last hundred odd days mm. of of Monash's mm. campaign, and it's brilliantly written, but it's World War One. The fascinating thing about <laughs> that is that you know that you you know the old saying, never say never. Mm. I had a <clears throat> bloke called Neil MacDonald that I wrote a book called 200 Shots with and he was Damien Perra's biographer and he wrote um, Chester Wilmot's biography and he kept saying to me over a number of years we ought to do a book on Charles Bean and um, General Monash the clash between the two of them because they did clash yep and yeah. so I went into that and I started to see the reason I didn't want to do a World War I book is because in my ignorance, it seemed to me to be almost mindless slaughter. Well, it, it was. Yeah, and it drove me away from yeah. it. But when I started looking at Monash, I saw who I believe is streets ahead of anyone in our history, our greatest soldier, no doubt about it. Yeah. He was a genius for war. He could incorporate, and I think it comes back to his ability as an engineer, he could look at artillery and look at the air arm and look at infantry and look at the tanks and look at logistics and he could bring it all together, man, manage it and make it tick like a Swiss clock. Yeah. And that got me in. And well, I, th I think, you see, once again, this comes back, I suppose, to this idea that we got so preoccupied with Gallipoli for a couple of generations and yet you wouldn't really compare Gallipoli with those last hundred days. You just yeah. and yet if you said to the average person in the street, Have you heard of Gallipoli? Well they'd laugh at you. But if you said to them, Have you heard of Mons and Quentin? Yeah. Perron. Yeah. Um, Hamel. Yeah. And it it fascinates me that people make so or give so much emphasis to one particular battle 
and very often it's unearned. I'm not a great one for rating battles because I think it's almost mission impossible. I mean, if if you and Keith are both generals and I'm going to evaluate you as to who was the best, what was the opposition like? Did you have the tools of war? What was the terrain like? Now, having said that a minute ago, I said I thought Monash was the best general we've ever had, but I don't think there's too much of an argument about it. I think he's just a light year ahead of anything we've ever raised. I think so. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would agree with you. And they're amazing battles and, and lovely little towns, and I was there just nearly two years or so ago, and yeah. there's no great distance between Peron and no. Mont St. Quentin. No. It's, it's, these things we learned about, the distances are totally different different than what we have here in, in exactly, Australia. Exactly. It's, it's all so close together. That, I think, that yeah, amazed me. And most people living there didn't go from one village to the next. They each had a mayor. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you know what astounded me about my trip to France? I went and saw the battlegrounds, and it's the old story, don't listen to anyone, make your own opinion when you get there. I could not believe the reaction I got from French people, not one or two, 99% of them, as soon as they said, what are you doing here? You know, are you a tourist? Oh, yes, uh, I'm a military historian and I'm here looking at battlegrounds. Oh, yes, which country? Australia. To this day, mm. the oh, yeah. French think very, very highly. Mm. I think of two things. One, the quality of the soldier, but the quality of the bloke. Yeah. They were a remarkable generation too. Very, very good. So uh, anyone listening, if you, when you get the opportunity, go Go to France. Go to the Western Front. Go to Belgium. Belgium yes. And, um, go to England too. Get it in perspective. And, and look at look at where they came across from, and where they went to get fixed up. Do, doesn't well. doesn't that part of the world? Owe, well, ha, how can you owe a nation? But uh, do you know what yeah. astounded me in in France? It just astounded me. I I I believe Mont means mountain yes, mm. in mount, French. Yeah, yeah. Mont Saint Quentin is a piddling little <laughs> hill, if you want to be yeah. blunt about it. Yeah. And I, I stood on it, and I thought, my God, if this is your idea of a mountain, <laughs> but then it's the old story that you, the two of you, would be so well aware, and your listeners would be, he who holds the, the high, high ground, ground. <laughs> it doesn't have to be all that high. And and that that amazed me, just standing there and looking out, and yeah. you're talking about. Um, Amion and that kind of thing. The high ground isn't high, but it's just relatively higher than the do you defile. Know, yeah. Do you know the other thing that scared me to death? I was at the War Memorial when I was researching the book, and one of the staff came over to me and said, look, would you like to come and see our warehouse? And he drove me out to where they keep all the stuff they haven't got on display. There's acres of it. Yep, and he said, have a look at this. I, I was able to crawl inside, and when you're six foot three, you crawl inside a Mark IV tank from the First World War. Yeah. And then I did the scary thing. Being an idiot at heart, I thought, what, what, try and get a sense, Peter, of what it would be like to be a German in a pit and have one of these fellows come at you. And so I crouched mm. in front of one, and my God, it was scary. Yeah. And then nothing to do with the First World War. He said, come and have a look at this. And it was a V-2 rocket from yeah. World War Two, And he said, this is the best preserved V-2 in the world. Wow. And, I mean, it was like a little kid in a candy store. <laughs> Everywhere you looked was just heaps and heaps of tanks, guns, planes, you name yeah. it. It's that time again, Peter. Look, once again, thank you very much for coming in. You're I welcome. Hope, I hope our listeners have enjoyed it. Um We'll, have, we'll get you back sometime. Um, but I'd like to say good night to everyone. Yeah, good night, Peter. Good night, David. Good night, listeners.